Okay. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Chatting with Agnes and Cecilia. Today is Monday, September 16th, and we're here to talk about ethics and the 501c organization. We're doing our episode a little different today due to some technology issues, so thank you to our audience for your patience and acceptance, which we truly appreciate. Uh, Chatting with Agnes and Cecilia is brought to you by Rogue Tulips LLC. We do 501c consulting and association management services, and we are a proud supporter of the 501c League, which is a virtual membership organization for all 501c professionals and members of the 501c community and the people who love them. And thanks to the 501c League, they inspired our topic today, which again is ethics in the 501c organization because the 501c league is presenting a course that you can take in real time as a webinar and it's called the ethical nonprofit the ethical nonprofit course you can learn more about that at the website the 501c league.net and go to courses and training it's based on this book making ethical decisions by michael josephson who started a whole institute about ethics and building good character in our communities so today we want to talk about uh, not just that course, but how that course inspired us uh, to talk about this broader topic. But before we dig into the topic, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Cecilia Sepp. I'm the principal and founder of Rogue Tulips LLC. And this is my co-host and friend and colleague, Agnes. Agnes, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Cecilia. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our global audience, wherever side of the world that you're operating from. My name is Agnes Amos Coleman. I'm an author and a consultant with Rogue Tulip. Over to you, Cecilia. Great, thank you, Agnes. And uh, some of you may know Agnes wrote a book called Transforming Business Through Godly Governance, and it outlines nine characteristics of uh, how you can bring a better workplace to life through your own actions. So that book was inspired by a series of conversations that Agnes and I had, and she sat down and wrote the book. So always kudos to her for that, and I highly recommend it. But uh, the book was inspired by our conversations, and those conversations not only inspired the book, but inspired a lot of our founding principles at Rogue Tulips. We have seven pillars of success, which you can read on our website at roguetulips.com. But what is important to us is being professional and ethical and compassionate as consultants working with 501c organizations. And what ethics are, you may wonder, well, what exactly are ethics? You may think of Aristotle, you may think of Socrates, or perhaps other philosophers, and you may think, ooh, I'm not really a philosopher. Well, ethics are actually pretty easy. Some people like to describe ethics as what you do when no one is looking. And I think that's a really good way to frame that conversation because it's the series of principles that you use to determine your behaviors and your actions in given situations. And what we hope ethics do is push us in a direction of right choices and, and ethical choices in the framework of we're doing what is best, not just for ourselves, but for everybody else involved in the transaction. And Agnes has a very good overview of ethics for organizations. Thanks, Cecilia. You know, as you were mentioning and talking about the overview for our discussion today on ethics, my mind kind of went to um, organizations like Enron, WorldCom, and Tyco, and Health South. And even for our global organizations, uh, organization like Enron was global, so I'm sure that you're probably familiar with them, or if you're not, it's something that you could Google and, and check out what led to their demise. Um, I begin to think about, you know, what are the approaches that our 501c community can take uh, to make sure that they are looking at ethics from a kind of a helicopter view. And, and really, mm -hmm. there are three areas that we need to consider here as 501c community. Um, we need to be proactive in this. Uh, and the proactive yeah. means that we really need to put um, control measures in place uh, to support the board and organization. Because when you think about it, uh, if we're going to put controls and measure in place, we need to look at it from an organizational view and we need to get a buy-in from the board of directors. The second area is that we need to look at uh, putting in place effective compliance. And the third mm -hmm. piece that we need to look at providing education and training. So 
I'm going to let you share your kind of take on this, Cecilia, and then we'll go back to those three areas because there are certain topics that we can look in those three areas uh, before we move on. So over to you, Cecilia. Yeah, that's really great. And uh, I hope I don't miss any of them. But uh, I think when talking about building that ethical culture, I, I think I'll use that phraseology because you do have to think about it. You have to act on it. Like you said, having compliance as well. Now, now we might think compliance is something punitive, and it, it's really not. Uh, what compliance does is mean everybody understands what we mean by ethics in our organization and that we all act on that because we create an ethical organization by our actions. So uh, some real world examples of that are sitting down and talking with the people you work with at your 501c organization about what do you believe is ethical behavior in a situation. So you make the right choices. Uh, we've all heard stories. I'm a former chapter relations professional, although I guess we're all still CRP at heart. Uh, but you, I've heard stories about embezzlement at local chapters, uh, bullying, uh, people taking equipment, things that don't necessarily belong to them personally. And so those are kind of extreme ethical breaches. Uh, but, but just like those daily ethics of the way we interact with each other. Uh, being considerate, being polite at the very least or courteous as opposed to snapping at everybody. Uh, and calling people on bad behavior is also ethical in my opinion. I don't know if Agnes agrees with that necessarily, but I think if somebody's being a bully in the office or on your board of directors, they need to be spoken to about that. Because you, again, you build the culture that you want. And then when you're talking about continuing that education, you take courses, of course, you can take a course. And yes, uh, here's another here. Okay, this is just a blatant plug to please take the ethical nonprofit course at the 501c league. It's a very good course. And it's being led by Cheryl Ronk, who uh, is a leader in our profession, and has been a leader in CAE development courses over the years. So you don't, if you don't take that course, take another one, though, or at least you know, get a book like this. This is a very good book. It was written in 2002, but it's still very applicable. And you can get a copy of this book at their website, the Jefferson, Josephson Institute, and you can buy your own copy and read it. But the thing is, you have to have these conversations and you have to discuss the definition of ethics, how we're going to apply ethics, how we're going to treat our our consultants ethically, how we're going to treat our industry partners ethically, how we're going to treat our members ethically because you you really have to have these conversations and I think we don't do it. Uh, one of the things Agnes and I discussed that I brought up in our in our prep work for this episode was I work very hard at being an ethical person and making those right choices. And because I do that regularly, I don't necessarily think about it consciously anymore. And so being part of developing this ethics course and talking about it today is making me think about it, making me think about it again. And one of the things I like to say to people is there is right and there is wrong and everything in between is judgment. So to me, there isn't necessarily gray areas. That's judgment. That's where you use your experience and knowledge and your commitment to ethics, whatever your personal ethics happen to be, those principles by which you live to make the right decision in those fuzzy areas of our lives. And uh, I don't know. What do you think about that, Agnes? I totally agree, Cecilia, with your perspective on that. And, and I think as you were talking, I, I was looking at, you mentioned earlier on about culture, um, you know, but we also need to look at the values of the organization, establishing the values, yeah. and not only just the, you know, uh, you have to look at the organization ethical areas and you have to look at the culture. Um, and then you have to set boundaries and setting boundaries, it's where the consequences come into play. And the consequences come into play when there is compliance. So you have staff, you have board of directors who make a commitment that this is where we want to go with this ethical directions. And if you don't comply with it, there are federal and state guidelines that bound all of us uh, in the 501c community. Um, and I think to your point on training, yes, if you want to, like anything in life, with anything you want to communicate, if you go, don't guide people through how they're going to, you know, walk through this process, there's always a gray area. 
and, and what training does, training like the one the 501C is going to be putting in place on ethics, is that it helps clarify and puts clarity some of these areas that people are unaware or unsure of. And, and that's, you know, because ethics is, you know, what it means for you could be different from what it means for me. But really providing right. that clarity does really does help. And a training is an excellent way to do that. And so, Agnes, uh, I, I don't mean to catch you off guard, but what's the type of question you might ask? I mean, you've written this great book, Transforming Business Through Godly Governance. And we did three, our first three episodes of this series was about that book. Uh, so what, what might be a question or two that you think an organization could ask itself, specifically a 501c organization, to ask itself to establish its own definition of ethics and how it wants to behave going forward? You know, good, you know, good point, Cecilia. And I guess for me, the first, this is a strategic issue as well for the 501c community. And, and the issue here is as an organization, as a board of directors, as the staff, you need to anticipate what your risk of ethics are. You need to look mm -hmm. at your organization, you need to look at what you're operating in and begin to ask, where are we vulnerable? Where are we vulnerable as staff in our business areas? A good example would be, um, you know, in your conference area, because I know for most 501c community, conference is a high revenue area. And you have mm -hmm. staff that work within that, you know, uh, 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 scope. You know, you have a meeting planner, an events director, or your staff generally, even the, even the, the executive director, you know, looking at farm trips that you take, looking at, um, you know, uh, facilities that you go to and really mm -hmm. looking at, what you, how you do business with them. Do you take farm trips when you know in your heart of hearts that you're not going to be, you know, using that facility, but you just want to go there because you want to enjoy the trips. These are really broader issues that you need to be asking in a strategic level that how would our organization or our association or 501c community play in the space? So it is a strategic issue and it's a strategic question that we need to ask and be honest with ourselves and begin to then mm -hmm. narrow it down on how we're going to respond. And that would then shape how mm -hmm. we establish our values. Yeah, I think, you know, that's really great overview and summary at the same time, I think, because we do have to ask ourselves these questions. And I think the thing that sets apart the 501c organization is the fact that they are mission-driven. And so if you are a mission-driven organization in the 501c area, that means you exist for a higher purpose than just making money. There's nothing wrong with making money, but that's not what 501c's are about. And I think sometimes while we try to learn from for-profit businesses, I think too often in our community, we're getting off that track. And, and we're talking about how much money can we make as opposed to how are we reinforcing our mission? And that's where your comments about strategy come into play. Because strategy supports your mission. Because strategy supports your goals. Your goals support the mission. The mission-driven organization is a successful organization and that is what sets us apart as 501c organizations. We are not about having millions of dollars of for-profit subsidiaries necessarily. 501c organizations were created as a designation to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And we all say we want to make the world a better place. So how do you make the world a better place if you're not ethical? Mm. And you have to ask yourself these hard questions. We have to look at ourselves, not just as individuals, but individuals participating in the 501c community. And are we making those choices? Are we turning down the site visit to Aspen? Because we know we're never going to do that conference in Aspen because our members can't afford to go to Aspen. Um, are we making sure that our volunteer leaders, because I've also heard stories about volunteer leaders going on site visits, uh, because they want to have a vacation. Uh, I have heard examples of 501c leaders, volunteer leaders, not staff leaders, 
running organizations into bankruptcy because they're flying themselves around first class and staying in five-star hotels and eating $400 meals and paying for it out of the association's budget. And that's where we need to make sure that volunteer, those are extreme examples, but we've heard those examples. We all hear these horror stories. We tell them to each other quietly over drinks after the conference the end of the day. We whisper these things in the dark about these stories we've heard. Uh, but the ethical aspect of that is we may be having these in smaller pieces, these things of, is it okay to, to misrepresent something to your board because you really feel it's a good idea? No, it's not a good, no, it's not right. You got to make your pitch. And during my short stint as a CEO, I would make a pitch. And if they accepted it at the board level, that meant I made a good pitch. If they didn't accept it, it meant I made a bad pitch. And I would say that to them after the board meeting, well, I should have made a stronger argument. I will come back with a stronger argument and more data. Uh, because I do think it's important, but I haven't convinced you yet. That's mm -hmm. ethical. Not lying to people. Not lobbying board members to vote your way. That's not ethical either. Because as the chief staff executive, and the chief staff executive is the one who sets the tone for ethics. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are, if you want to have an ethical board, if you want to have an ethical organization, you have to set that example whether or not everybody else is going to necessarily be ethical too. Mm -hmm. Because the, this is what creates the drama of life, you know, uh, in the stories. It's like somebody's trying to do the right thing and somebody else doesn't want to do the right thing and there's conflict and it resolves one way or the other. But, uh, oh, gee, I think we went a little past our 15 minutes today because it's an important topic. But, Agnes, I'm going to throw it back to you for a few minutes uh, for any uh, other thoughts you want to share or closing summaries. Sure, Cecilia, and thank you for that insight as well. Uh, you see, as we dialogue in this, pro in this field or in this topic area of ethics, it, obviously it's a very, very broad topic. Uh, again, that's why it becomes a very strategic issue because what ethical issues mean for your organization of 501C, it's definitely different from what it means for the other organization. And then, of course, you have the personal ethical issues. Uh, and my point in closing is that that is why education and training, it's so important for all stakeholders involved to be able to identify what are the areas of ethical issues that your organization is struggling from or as an individual and of course i cannot stress that enough um, and 501c league is having this ethical program so i that's a good step or if you identify any other ethics course that you want to go to just attend the program attend a course that will broaden your horizon and will give you a better view of what you can begin to look for in an ethical areas that impact your 501c. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Agnes. That's a great closing. Um, this is obviously a big topic, and I think we may do it again uh, as a follow-up episode, uh, but because there's a lot to cover here. But uh, as always, we want to thank you for watching. We want to thank you for telling people about it. Uh, we do appreciate getting Oh, my earphone, oh, earphone issues. The technology issues continue. Uh, but uh, I did get a nice email from someone the other day complimenting one of our episodes. So we love the feedback. If you have feedback, share that. Uh, and as always, I want to thank my co-host and friend, Agnes Amos Coleman, for sharing her insights on, on these issues uh, every week. And as we always like to close with, uh, take 15 minutes and talk with someone because you might learn something. So thanks again for watching, and we'll be back next week with a new topic. Bye, everybody. Bye.